All right. So, so maybe the most common question I get from friends of mine who are still invested in the Democratic Party when I tell them I won't support Democrats, but I don't support Trump, I don't support any of that. Well, so what's your end game? What's your end game? What's your plan? How would you answer that? I think it depends on what, uh, what, um, wh whom you're speaking on behalf of. So if you're speaking or, or if you're claim, claiming to speak on behalf of the tens of millions of working people of the richest, in the richest country of the history of humanity, then you do need a strategy out of the Democrats and Republicans because first of all, the rise of Trumpism, those, those the people who are just point number one, we have to go to the economic questions in a second, but uh, on the face of it, those who are worried about Trump and Trumpism and the rise of the right wing, we're, we 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 are as much worried as I mean, as a socialist, I'm the polar opposite uh, on the political spectrum from Trump, and it is absolutely worrisome, and we cannot we cannot underestimate the dangers uh, that could happen for the working class as a whole, for the immigrant community, for uh, LGBTQ people. All of this, we have to be very clear. However, if that's your goal then supporting Kamala Harris or any such anointed Democrat or the Democratic Party in general, period, is the opposite of a solution to addressing the right, rise of the right wing because it is precisely the betrayals of the Democratic Party that have created an opening for the right wing. And that's happened in the absence of a left leadership. And that's why building working class leadership is so crucial because let's not forget the Tea Party movement which is the precursor of today's Trumpism, that arose out of the betrayals of Obama. Remember how he pushed Medicare for all off the table. What a scandalous moment that was. He ran on the promise that he was, remember he said no troop surge in Afghanistan. And then first thing he does is a troop surge in Afghanistan. So it was a whole track record of betray, betrayals on promises by the Democrats that created an opening for the Tea Party because working people are angry and they want, they're angry at the establishment as a whole. So what happens when you have any section of the Republican Party or the right wing posing as, oh, I'm not from the out, I'm, I'm not from the inside, I'm, I'm an outsider, then people are uh, tempted to fall for it because they are looking to grasp for something. And that's the basis on which Trump, the con man, has done that. And I hope we can talk about the RNC as well. I mean, because I thought the right wing populism was off the charts. And I and I, I think it would be useful to talk about it. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that. Sure. Yeah. But 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 let's not forget the economics of what's happening here. If people want to stand up for working people, then you have to get out of the whole Washington, D.C. discussion and look at what's happened under Democrats and under Republicans. This is in response to Russell's question. The share of Americans who are in financial distress due to the inability of, to pay their credit card payments is, the, is, is now reached the same level as during the Great Recession. I mean, this is a damning, damning indictment of what the Democrats and Republicans have presided over. And we have seen the number of consumers who said it was very difficult for them to pay their household bills just in the last weeks has jumped from 26.9 million in October 2021, when the pandemic was in full swing, to 43.2 million. And that this was last year, and now it's increased even more. So you have more and more statistics. There are other statistics about housing unaffordability and so on, which really show that that is really that is what's creating this opening for Trumpism, where there is no alternative for working people. And that's why uh, I hope we'll talk about this as well. That's why I'm supporting Jill Stein, as, as not because I think she's going to win, but because unless we give an alternative to the Democrats and Republicans in the presidential election year, we are not going to find an avenue to build a party for working people, which is what we need. Well, that, that's really the question. How, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to reform the system? Are we trying to overthrow the system? What means are we trying to take? And that that's that's a question that we get all the time. Well, so what's so what's your plan? So what is it? It's 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 very difficult 
to answer that in the situation that we're in, where you have this enormous establishment that has incredible power, perhaps more power than an elite class has ever had because of the technology that we have now, the kind of total social control that's possible for an entrenched elite today. So what are we really doing? How, how do we really challenge that? I think the part of the basis for challenging that is whether you have, whether we're in a period where a mass of working people is willing to fight back, has the morale to fight back. I mean, that's a big, in our, in our view, that's the biggest uh, factor because you can't accomplish anything from a few people. It's, it's only when millions of people are willing to fight back that something can change. And I don't disagree at all with the with what you're saying. I mean, it, it, it does seem overwhelming. It is, uh, I'm completely compassionate to people who feel that I don't even know where to start. Uh, I, I know the society needs to change, but I don't know where, where to begin. How, how can this even change? The elite have such a grip on uh, the levers of power in society. All that is true. And in fact, there are even aspects of a Gilded Age happening in more than one country right now, including my home country, India, which I know, Russell, you have visited. Uh, and, and you know, we just saw this uh, insane, endless wedding festivities of the richest man in Asia. <laughs> I'm sure you've read about. I, well, I, and, I was there during the wedding season. Oh, you were. And it was, yeah, every night there were people out in the street. I, I had never seen that before, but it was nothing like this wedding. <laughs> no. These yeah, are relative, no. relatively uh, moderate events by comparison. Yes. No, I, I know what you mean. But ultimately, yeah, internationally, what you're seeing is uh, more and more wealth consolidated in the hands of the billionaire class and, and more and more. Uh, sort of um, uh, aspects of what you could call a, a, a new era of a gilded age in this era of the new Cold War and age of disorder, as it's been called. Uh, but in terms of how to fight back, I think the first component is, are people willing to fight back? Do we Is our assessment of consciousness that people want to fight back? My assessment would be absolutely. I don't think from that front, we should be despondent because if you look at, for example, the um, the last year became the year since 1986, the big year with the biggest numbers of workers involved in major strike actions, major strike actions being defined as thousand workers or more on strike. And, uh, you know, that itself is a basis to understand that actually tens of millions of people are fed up. And even going back in 2016, you, uh, you, I, yes, Bernie Sanders sold us out. But if you look at the people around him, the reason he became such a powerful enemy to be taken down by the Democratic Party elite was because his campaign electrified working people. So as far as one component of what we need to have successful struggle is, is there consciousness in favor of it? Absolutely. What's missing is, again, what we were talking about earlier, which is leadership. Unfortunately, that is a hard one, and we do need to fight against that. And that's why there need to be some honest conversations on the left. So if you look at, obviously, the liberal organizations have completely failed us. Their leadership has completely failed us. The Democratic Party is a complete wasteland as far as movement building is concerned. But then you come to the labor leadership. They have also failed us for the most part. For the most part, the labor leadership uh, is in the pockets of the Democratic Party. And, you know, like if you look at $250 million donated to the Biden campaign from the labor movement, it's disastrous. It's been a disastrous strategy to begin with. And now it's going to be, and I think it already is, a bandwagon for Kamala Harris. And then on the other hand, you have Sean O'Brien going to the Republican National Convention, which, you know, we can talk about. But both are disastrous avenues for working people to put any faith in either of these two parties. And that's why I don't have a straightforward answer to that question in the sense that it does require leadership that understands the kind of strategy we used in Seattle. And I hate pointing to our effort, honestly, because it sounds like, oh, we were just pointing to that. But the reason I keep going back to that is because there is no other example of the kind that we showed, which is independent of the Democrats and Republicans, and at the same time, not being marginalized, being successful in winning victories, being successful in rallying tens of thousands of people to rest historic victories are from the hands of the 
ruling class. I was telling this to Brianna the other day is that, you know, reporters sometimes asked me, what is what 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 will be your measure of success five years from now, 10 years from now? And they always asked it from a personalized standpoint and as if I, I care about my career. But my response to them always was that, look, if 10 years from now, I am forced to again go back to the example in Seattle, that I will think of as not having made progress on the left because there should be mu much bigger examples of what we did in Seattle. But we don't have that. And that's the unfortunate part, not to be despondent, just to be soberly clear, that's the kind of fighting strategy we need. And we need to replicate that nationally in big battles. You know, So we need to win some big battles like winning Medicare for all. The UAW strike was important, but there were some limitations there as well. And then it doesn't help. And this is, I'll just stop on this one. Sorry, I've been going on. But when you have a labor leadership, even like the leadership of Sean Fain, which did win, win historic gains, for the auto workers and it became a sort of a kind of a beacon for working people correctly so but then you know he uh, passes a resolution for, in favor of ceasefire and then turns around and endorses biden see that kind of strategy it ends up stymieing movements we do need to break that log jam we need leadership that is independent of these two parties yeah absolutely and i think it requires a discipline and a precision and an execution so that you don't get co-opted. I mean, uh, you know, in the face of that 2020 campaign, which was just a hopeless campaign after they crushed Bernie again, and it's Biden versus Trump, and everybody's depressed and not knowing what to do, these George Floyd protests spring up, and that was a real moment there, where all of a sudden you had overwhelming percentages of Americans, you know, saying we need radical police reform, criminal justice reform, and what did that end up doing as you say the mismet the misleadership of that movement ended up sucking that right back into the democratic party and it's something that happens so often and one of the reasons why i think you are forced to cite your own work and this is why people have you on their shows you're one of the only people out there who actually who actually has a record of organization and success and precision please clap